everybody has their weak sides, let's say, things they're embarrassed about. When I first started going to the gym, I was like, how old was I? 1985, 23. And I think I weighed 135 pounds and I was five, six foot one, very, very thin. A twi, I write, 27 inch waist, something like that. And I smoked like mad and I drank too much. Like I wasn't in good shape. <laughs> the first, the first attempts forward I took in the gym, I went to this swim exercise class. Jesus, it was me and this like really fat guy, young guy, probably not in any worse shape than me, and like seven old women over 70, and they could outswim me. Like it was pretty damn humiliating. And so I did a semester of that and got myself in somewhat better shape. And then I started to go to the gym to work out, to lift weights. And that was also rough because, you know, I'd be underneath the bloody bench press trying to lift 75 pounds off the off the rests and you know some muscle-headed bastard would come over and tell me how to do it and it's like yeah thank you but you know it's embarrassing and lots of times people won't do things like go to the gym because they're so embarrassed about how they look or what sort of shape they're in and it's a pain to start at the bottom but you start at the bottom where you're weak and if you want to rectify what's weak you have to accept the fact that you're at the bottom and that the first steps are going to be painful you know I it took me about three years, but I stopped smoking and then I stopped drinking and I gained 40 pounds of muscle in like three and a half years, something like that. I basically had to stop doing that because I had to eat like six times a day. It was crazy, but I got a lot more physically confident and a lot more coordinated because working out with dumbbells makes you coordinated right because it, it exercises all the small ligaments and the tendons and so my lower body in particular got a lot more coordinated then I could dance so that was better when I was going out dancing because I did a lot of that in graduate school and but the point of all this is if you're going to rectify your weaknesses you have to admit your insufficiency to your own shame now if the gap between you and your ideal is so great that it paralyzes you you shrink that right Set your ambitions, even if you are uncertain about what they should be. The better ambitions have to do with the development of character and ability, rather than status and power. Status, you can lose. You carry character with you wherever you go, and it allows you to prevail against adversity. Knowing this, tie a rope to a boulder. Pick up the great stone, heave it in front of you, and pull yourself towards it. Watch and observe while you move forward. Articulate your experience as clearly and carefully to yourself and others as you possibly can. In this manner, you will learn to proceed more effectively and efficiently towards your goal. And while you are doing this, do not lie, especially to yourself. If you pay attention to what you do and say, you can learn to feel a state of internal division and weakness when you are misbehaving and misspeaking. It's an embodied sensation, not a thought. I experience an internal sensation of sinking and division rather than solidity and strength when I am incautious with my acts and words. It seems to be centered in my solar plexus, where a large knot of nervous tissue resides. I learned to recognize when I was lying, in fact, by noticing this sinking and division, and then inferring the presence of a lie. It often took me a long time to ferret out the deception. Sometimes I was using words for appearance. Sometimes I was trying to disguise my own true ignorance of the topic at hand. Sometimes I was using the words of others to avoid the responsibility of thinking for myself. If you pay attention, when you are seeking something, you will move towards your goal. More importantly, however, you will acquire the information that allows your goal itself to transform. A totalitarian never asks, what if my current ambition is in error? He treats it. Instead, as the absolute. It becomes his God for all intents and purposes. It constitutes his highest value. It regulates his emotions and motivational states and determines his thoughts. All people serve their ambition. In that matter, there are no atheists. There are only people who know and don't know what God they serve. If you bend everything totally, blindly and willfully towards the attainment of a goal, and only that goal, you will never be able to discover if another goal would serve you and the world better. It is this that you sacrifice if you do not tell the truth. If instead you tell the truth, 
Your values transform as you progress. If you allow yourself to be informed by the reality manifesting itself as you struggle forward, your notions of what is important will change. You will reorient yourself, sometimes gradually and sometimes suddenly and radically. What happens if, instead, we decide to stop lying? What does this even mean? We are limited in our knowledge after all. We must make decisions here and now, even though the best means and the best goals can never be discerned with certainty. An aim, an ambition, provides the structure necessary for action. An aim provides a destination, a point of contrast against the present and a framework within which all things can be evaluated. An aim defines progress and makes such progress exciting. An aim reduces anxiety, because if you have no aim, everything can mean anything or nothing, and neither of those two options makes for a tranquil spirit. Thus, we have to think and plan and limit and pause it in order to live at all. How then to envision the future and establish our direction without falling prey to the temptation of totalitarian certainty? Some reliance on tradition can help us establish our aims. It is reasonable to do what other people have always done, unless we have a very good reason not to. It is reasonable to become educated and work, and find love, and have a family. That is how culture maintains itself. But it is necessary to aim at your target, however traditional, with your eyes wide open. You have a direction, but it might be ill-formed. You may have been led astray by your own ignorance, and worse, by your own unrevealed corruption. You must make friends, therefore, with what you don't know, instead of what you know. You must remain awake to catch yourself in the act. You must remove the beam in your own eye, before you concern yourself with the moat in your brothers. And in this way, you strengthen your own spirit, so it can tolerate the burden of existence, and you rejuvenate the state. It is our responsibility to see what is before our eyes, courageously, and to learn from it, even if it seems horrible, even if the horror of seeing it damages our consciousness and half blinds us. The act of seeing is particularly important when it challenges what we know and rely on, upsetting and destabilizing us. It is the act of seeing that informs the individual and updates the state. You are by no means only what you already know. You are also all that which you could know, if you only would. Thus. You should never sacrifice what you could be for what you are. You should never give up the better that resides within for the security you already have, and certainly not when you have already caught a glimpse, an undeniable glimpse, of something beyond. In the Christian tradition, Christ is identified with the Logos. The Logos is the Word of God. That Word transformed chaos into order at the beginning of time. In his human form, Christ sacrificed himself voluntarily to the truth, to the good, to God. In consequence, he died and was reborn. The word that produces order from chaos sacrifices everything, even itself, to God. That single sentence, wise beyond comprehension, sums up Christianity. Every bit of learning is a little death. Every bit of new information challenges a previous conception, forcing it to dissolve into chaos before it can be reborn as something better. Sometimes, such deaths virtually destroy us. In such cases, we might never recover, or if we do, we change a lot. A good friend of mine discovered that his wife of decades was having an affair. He didn't see it coming. It plunged him into a deep depression. He descended into the underworld. He told me at one point, I always thought that people who are depressed should just shake it off. I didn't have any idea what I was talking about. Eventually, he returned from the depths. In many ways, he's a new man, and perhaps a wiser and better man. He lost 40 pounds. He ran a marathon. He traveled to Africa and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. He chose rebirth over descent into hell. Imagine, you go to engineering school because that is what your parents desire. But it is not what you want, working at cross. Purposes to your own wishes, you will find yourself unmotivated and failing. You will struggle to concentrate and discipline yourself, but it will not work. Your soul will reject the tyranny of your will. How else could that be said? Why are you complying? You may not want to disappoint your parents, although if you fail, you will do exactly that. You may lack the courage for the conflict necessary to free yourself. 
You may not want to sacrifice your childish belief in parental omniscience, wishing devoutly to continue believing that there is someone who knows you better than you know yourself, and who also knows all about the world. You want to be shielded in this manner from the stark existential aloneness of individual being, and its attendant responsibility. This is all very common and understandable. But you suffer because you are truly not meant to be an engineer. One day you have had enough. You drop out. You disappoint your parents. You learn to live with that. You consult only yourself, even though that means you must rely on your own decisions. You take a philosophy degree. You accept the burden of your own mistakes. You become your own person. By rejecting your father's vision, you develop your own. And then, as your parents age, you've become adult enough to be there for them. When they come to need you, they win too. But both victories had to be purchased at the cost of the conflict engendered by your truth. As Matthew 10, 34 has it, citing Christ, emphasizing the role of the spoken truth. Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. As you continue to live in accordance with the truth, as it reveals itself to you, you will have to accept and deal with the conflicts that mode of being will generate. If you do so, you will continue to mature and become more responsible in small ways. Don't underestimate their importance and enlarge. You will ever more closely approach your newer and more wisely formulated goals and become even wiser in their formulation when you discover and rectify your inevitable errors. Your conception of what is important will become more and more appropriate as you incorporate the wisdom of your experience. You will quit wildly oscillating and walk ever more directly towards the good, a good you could never have comprehended if you had insisted despite all evidence that you were right, absolutely right, at the beginning. If existence is good, then the clearest and cleanest and most correct relationship with it is also good. If existence is not good, by contrast, you're lost. Nothing will save you, certainly not the petty rebellions, murky thinking and obscurantist blindness that constitute deceit. Is existence good? You have to take a terrible risk to find out. Live in truth or live in deceit. Face the consequences and draw your conclusions. This is the act of faith whose necessity was insisted upon by the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard. You cannot know ahead of time even a good example is insufficient for proof, given the differences between individuals. The success of a good example can always be attributed to luck. Thus, you have to risk your particular, individual life to find out. It is this risk that the ancients described as the sacrifice of personal will to the will of God. It is not an act of submission, at least as submission is currently understood. It is an act of courage. It is faith that the wind will blow your ship to a new and better port. It is the faith that being can be corrected by becoming. It is the spirit of exploration itself. Perhaps it is better to conceptualize it this way. Everyone needs a concrete, specific goal, an ambition, and a purpose to limit chaos and make intelligible sense of his or her life. But all such concrete goals can and should be subordinated to what might be considered a meta-goal which is a way of approaching and formulating goals themselves. The meta goal could be live in truth. This means act diligently towards some well-articulated, defined and temporary end. Make your criteria for failure and success timely and clear, at least for yourself and even better if others can understand what you are doing and evaluate it with you. While doing so, however, allow the world and your spirit to unfold as they will while you act out and articulate the truth. This is both pragmatic ambition and the most courageous of faiths.